Okay, thank you for joining us today for Fishing for Families, especially given all the icy mix and rain and snow and whatever else is out there today. And we had a number of uh, small delays this morning, so I appreciate everybody for, for making it in. Um, today, reporters Sam Eaton and Imelda Obano will talk to us about, about their reporting on population, environment, and food security in the Philippines. I'm Megan Parker of the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. For the last 19 years, ECSP has examined the connections between health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security. This event is part of a five-year effort on these HELPS topics, as we call them, that is generously funded by USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Sam Eaton, who will show his video on Food for Nine Billion, Turning the Population Tide in the Philippines. Sam is an independent radio and television producer, and his project, Food for Nine Billion, is an ongoing series produced by Homelands Productions and the Center for Investigative Reporting. The next chapter will be a series of stories exploring the future of food and is set to air on PRI's The World this spring. Uh, after Sam, Imelda Abano will comment on the video and on her work covering business and environmental issues in the Philippines and throughout Asia for the last 14 years. She's the founder and president of the Philippine Network of Environmental Journalists. And I'm especially pleased to introduce her uh, because she, like me, recently joined the Board of Directors of the Society of Environmental Journalists, bringing a much needed international perspective to, to the organization. And as a short word about where we're sitting, uh, the Wilson Center is the official memorial to our 28th president and it's a nonpartisan forum for independent research, open dialogue, and actionable ideas. We're not too many people here in this room, although I'm pleased with the turnout given the weather. And, uh, but we are webcasting this live and it will be archived for later viewing on wilsoncenter.org. When it comes time for the Q&A, please use the microphone so that people can hear you on the webcast. And please uh, state your name and affiliation. And are now to the Philippines, a country struggling to cope with its rapidly growing population. Tonight's story is part of a new project that looks at the challenge of feeding the world in a time of social and environmental change. It's a NewsHour partnership with the Center for Investigative Reporting, Homelands Productions, and American Public Media's Marketplace. The project is called Food for Nine Billion. The reporter for tonight's story is Sam Eaton of Homelands Productions. The Dinahan Double Barrier Reef off of Bohol Island in the southern Philippines is one of the richest marine biodiversity hotspots in the world. But just a short boat ride away, more than a million people depend on these fishing grounds for their food and livelihoods. Rice may be the staple food of the Philippines, but fish provide most of the protein in daily diets. And as the population of communities like this one soar, nearly tripling in the last three decades, the effect on the reef has been devastating. Fishermen are resorting to extreme tactics to boost their declining catch. We captured one boat uh, this morning. Nazario Avenido and his group of volunteers operate 24-hour patrols trying to protect their local fishing grounds. Illegal fishing has become rampant. Many use dynamite or cyanide, indiscriminately killing everything within their reach. Avenido has confiscated more than 50 boats and hundreds of illegal nets in recent years. Today, he seized this boat. Its owner, who escaped capture, was using a banned net that wreaks havoc on spawning grounds and sensitive corals. Avenido says the violators aren't bad people. They're just hungry. Because there is no other solution, especially when, when they are a very poor family. Poor in a country that has one of the highest population growth rates in all of Southeast Asia, every year adding about two million more mouths to feed. It's a hell of a problem. I think you just need to look at the statistics. Congressman Walden Bello says the Philippines is already beyond its carrying capacity. And that's today, with a population just shy of 100 million people. And so the demographers are really worried because they feel that most likely at the earliest we'll be stabilizing at around 200 million in 2080. That eventual doubling of the population presents an existential threat to the Philippines especially for the people who depend on its natural resources for food. I traveled to a rural fishing village called Umayumai to see how the issues of population growth, food, and the environment are connected. And what I found was surprising. Jason Bostero and his wife Krishna both grew up in large families typical of this area. 
But unlike the generations before them, the Bosteros made a deliberate choice to have only two children, James and Cyril Jean, ages six and nine. My income is just right to feed us three times a day. It's really, really different when you have a small family. That choice to have a smaller family was motivated by memories of going hungry as young children. In my case, we were really hard up before. Sometimes we would only eat once a day because we were so poor. We couldn't go to school. I did not finish school because there were just so many of us. The reason the Bosteros were able to have a smaller family is because they could choose to. A community-based family planning program has made birth control options like the pill accessible and affordable at about 70 cents a month for the first time in their village. In villages, we train and identify community-based distributors like this to be able to sell pills and condoms anytime. Dr. Joan Castro started the program here. This becomes as easy as buying soft drinks or matches. She's with the PATH Foundation Philippines, a group funded mostly through USAID. And what makes her program unique is its emphasis on local partners. Which brand of birth control pills are you selling more of? Well, they like the yellow one because it's cheaper. How much is it? It used to be 35 pesos, then it was 38, now it's 41. The idea is to be able to bring access to the people. Access that in remote villages like Umay Umay was non-existent before the PATH Foundation came in. In just six years since the program was first established here, family sizes have plummeted from as many as 12 children to a maximum of about four today. This village is one of the PATH Foundation's longest running case studies. And what it's showing is how closely tied family planning is with environmental conservation and putting food on the table. Out in the Dinahan Double Barrier Reef, where Jason Bostero fishes every morning, the shift to smaller families is already paying dividends. He and his neighbors have created a marine preserve to help revive fish stocks, and it's working. With smaller families, thinking about future generations is a luxury fishermen like Bostero can afford. Family planning is helpful because if you control the number of your children, you don't need as many fish to support your family. If you have many children, it's difficult to support them. Outside of Umayamai, where birth control remains largely out of reach, the struggle to put food on the table from one day to the next dominates life. Down the road, the gymnasium in the region's main town, Ubai, was filled recently with people waiting to collect government assistance checks for food. Many stood in line for up to 12 hours. For the families gathered here, these checks are a lifeline, making up for the declining catch from the sea. This scene is one that neighboring countries like Thailand and Indonesia have largely avoided thanks to state-sponsored family planning programs. But Congressman Walden Bello says in the Philippines, any efforts to do the same have faced stiff resistance. Uh, what's happening is what we've witnessed recently which is, you know, a hardline, scorched earth opposition on the part of the Catholic Church hierarchy uh, to any form of artificial uh, contraception. And in a country that's 80 percent Catholic, that opposition means something. For more than a decade, the church's leadership has rallied against a reproductive health bill in Congress that would guarantee universal access to birth control. Recently, it even threatened the president with excommunication for supporting the bill. That's why I said, don't fool with the church, because she will bury you. Filipino Archbishop Emeritus Oscar Cruz says the key to everyone having enough food to eat is a question of development, not population control. Once I was asked, uh, which would you prefer, to have less mouth to feed? or to have more food to eat. And I said, is there a choice there? Come on, if you have more, food, more mouth to feed, then produce more food to eat, not the other way around. But that challenge to produce more food is already testing the limits of ecosystems, both on land and sea. Today, the Philippines imports more rice than any other nation on the planet. 
And according to the World Bank, every major species of fish here shows signs of severe overfishing. Technological advances have helped boost the food supply, but they failed to keep pace with the Philippines' surging population growth. Maternity wards like this one at a Manila hospital are overwhelmed. Dr. Esmeraldo Elim heads the hospital's family planning unit, but spends most of his time these days with new mothers. She's only 29 years old. This is her seventh uh, child. According to the Guttmacher Institute, more than half of all pregnancies in the Philippines are unintended. It's the poor who come here for maternity care, but if they want to prevent pregnancies, they're out of luck. Absent any state funding for birth control, Dr. Elam has little to offer. That's a stark contrast to the Bohol Island fishing village, Umay Umay, where family planning is as close as the corner store. Here, the Path Foundation Philippines program has taken on a life of its own. The project is now fully integrated with the local government's rural health unit. The vision of the project is in this community you see more children educated who are able to become leaders and speak out for themselves in the future and be able to become stewards of their own sexuality and their and the future environment. This is the legacy. Dr. Castro says success stories like this one can help overcome traditional attitudes about birth control. Jason and Krishna Bostero, both practicing Catholics, don't see a conflict between their religious beliefs and family planning. For them, it's about something much more immediate, like what kind of future they're going to pass on to their two children. I don't want them to be like us, just to fish the sea, just to farm the land. This is not an easy way to earn a living. You are exposed to the sun. It's better if they can finish their courses so they can have comfortable lives. With both of their children in school, the Bosteros are hopeful about their future. But it's a future that could easily be overwhelmed by outside forces. After all, this is only one village in a country still deadlocked over a family planning law in a world that's projected to have nine billion mouths to feed by the middle of the century. Sam Eaton's reporting on the Philippines food story continues tonight on American Public Media's Marketplace. Listen to it on your public radio station. You can also find an interactive map, a timeline, and many more resources at the Food for Nine Billion website. There's a link to it on newshour.pbs.org. Um, is this, uh, can you guys hear me? Great. One, one uh, quick note, that family, the, the reproductive health bill actually passed recently in the Philippines after I think more than 20 years of trying to get it through. So that's happened since, since I reported this, um, this piece. Um, thanks so much everybody for coming out today. I know um, I, I, I came in from Los Angeles, so this, uh, the whole weather thing is, is very, um, um, foreign to me, I guess. <laughs> um, and thanks you, Megan, and the Wilson Center for having me. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here and to talk about this story. This was the first, um, the first piece I reported for this series. So um, since then, I've, I've um, been um, going to other places around the world and exploring different themes. Um, but I still, this one really sticks with me because I remember um, when, we, when we first started discussing how to do this story. Um, John Miller is the executive producer um, at Homelands Productions, um, and they brought me on to be a, a contributor in this, in this series. Um, we knew, or I knew from the beginning, that it was going to be a very challenging story to, to do, um, not one that, um, it just, just the, the complexity of it, the, the controversial element of, of even touching on anything that speaks about population growth and, and remedies. Um, I, I was the, uh, before this, I was the, um, the, the founding reporter of the Marketplace Sustainability Desk, and I worked there for, for um, many years before this. And we would gather every year and talk about the, the big sustainability themes that we wanted to discuss in the year ahead. And every year population would come up. And every year we'd, we'd kind of hem and haw and be like, well, maybe we'll, we'll take this on. Um, it was, it was, um, it's a really difficult um, subject to do in a, 
in a um, in a, a thorough uh, way. I'm, I'm trying to think of how even to describe it. I mean, I think um, I was very. I guess I was very excited to take it on and do it in, and do it with it within the context of this series, so that I could spend the time that I knew I would need to to make the story. These stories. There was a radio story as well on Marketplace that that was a little bit different. It looked more at the agricultural side. Um, but I felt, you know, a lot of pressure going when I got on that plane to go to the Philippines to really kind of strike the right balance. Um, and then um, Alan Weissman is one of the Homelands um, Productions um, team. Uh, he's an author who wrote the, the World Without Us, and he's now writing a book about population growth that should be out in the next couple months. Um, put me in touch with Joan at the PATH Foundation, and, and um, immediately I was struck by this kind of ready-made story. It was, um, it was, uh, it had all of the elements of, of a, a good story. But, you know, the more I, I read about it, there was this, this concept that was new to me, population, health, and environment. Um, and it just seemed like this abstract concept that I didn't even know if I was going to mention it in the piece because I, it sounded like, um, you know, th these are the kinds of things that I think are hard to translate into television and radio pieces. Um, and then I got there and, um, here, uh, I, I had spent a bunch of time traveling around the Philippines and spending time in, in the slums in Manila um, at the maternity ward. We saw some footage of that. And I arrive in this village, and, and it was such a contrast, it was such a stark contrast to the rest of what I had seen um, that I was immediately kind of struck by it. Um, here were these, uh, um, you know, very much poor subsistence farmers, rice farmers and fishermen. They would fish in the morning and, <clears throat> and work their rice fields in the afternoon. Um, hard, labor-intensive work. Um, but at the same time, I mean, these, these people, unlike so many that I had met, felt very much in control of their future. They were very empowered by this process. They spoke. Um, are very articulately about the, the future generations and about the, the reef and, and the problems that they were facing with overfishing. Um, as I think the story suggests, there's this, this backdrop of this, this fierce battle um, over two decades um, of, of trying to pass a reproductive health bill in the Philippines that would grant universal access to family planning. Um, you have a very highly politicized church there, still so. I think um, Imelda will talk about or mention um, that uh, there's something like six challenges <laughs> to the bill in the Supreme Court um, since it's been passed. So it's not, you know, even after the passage, it's still facing a lot of opposition. Um, but I think how population, health, and environment suddenly kind of made sense to me was that when you have um, a community like this that's so small, tight-knit, um, and very much living off the land and from the land, um, all of these things make sense. I mean, it's basically it's life, uh, this integrated approach. Um, and so I issues that, that, that can't be separated. Um, it's putting food on the table. It's um, making sure that your kids have three meals a day so that they, they can concentrate in school, so that they can go to school. Um, you know, having a, having a couple kids versus having 12, some words, upwards of, I think Imelda was saying, she's met families with how many? Like? One in 40. What's that? Children. Yeah, how many, like upwards of 15? I mean, I mean, it's it's um, you know, there's it's hard to kind of have opportunity for your children when there there are so many, um, and they also understood that um, the connection to to conservation with these choices of if you have children that are hungry, you're not going to think about the future of of you know fishing tomorrow or the next day or three years from now 50 years from now you're thinking about how can i get these kids some food and that's what's happening when you have um, the fishermen go out and use dynamite or cyanide um, to get their catch uh, it's it's about thinking about their children but not necessarily about the future environment that they will be living in um, and then there's the fact that this you know that this was a program that came in <clears throat> that utilized the, the resources of the community. So there was that ownership. Um, 
in Umayumai that was, I think, so essential to it lasting beyond kind of the PATH Foundation, setting up the pilot project, and then, um, and then it just had a life of its own. Um, the woman who was um, who was featured in there was also a, um, would go around and, and um, she trained so that she could um, consult with other families on family family um, family planning uh, and was was just a huge um, huge resource for the community in that respect as well. Um, one of the biggest challenges I think for population health and environment, um, these integrated approaches. So whether it be population health environment, um, as, I, as I'm looking towards other stories, I'm, I'm looking at agroecology as well, which really is, is, um, is looking at kind of the integrative approach to agricultural development um, and thinking about all of these different aspects um, uh, within, within, de within development. It's uh, the challenge. I think is how do you measure the the success of these um, in a way that you can you know get more funding or or get people excited about it by um, you know showing the statistics that this is working. Um, and it's also a challenge I think to scale up, um, not because it's not possible, but because the system I think rewards these projects that are focused singly focused. Um, whether it be improving seeds, seeds, or you know yields, or you know something that you can really you know point to a statistic and say, look, you know it was here and now it's here. Um, but it's not asking these questions that are so important right now, which I think is um, you know how what's its effect on poverty reduction? What's its effect on the environmental resources around it? The water table, um, the fossil fuel imports, um, the <coughs> excuse me, the long term. Resilience, um, when you think of climate change, which is going to be more and more of an important factor, um, especially for these um, smallholder farmers, for the for the world's poorest, who also live in some of the most vulnerable areas. I mean, this is very um, low-lying coastal um, areas where where these people were living, and and um, I think. Um, you know, I don't. I, I present these questions, but I don't really know the answer of how how do you, how do you how do you make this um, happen? You know, in a more significant way and and scale it up. Um, what I know is that uh, from my reporting, um, you know, I've done since then. I've traveled to Japan, um, to Vietnam. I'm about to go to to India um, uh, and Bolivia. <clears throat> and what I've seen is that this, this, you know, not using this integrated approach doesn't really translate on the ground. Um, it doesn't have the buy-in, I think, from, from people um, that are experienced the, at the tail end of these programs. Um, <clears throat> in Vietnam, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in Vietnam I did a, a story about the aquaculture, kind of the rapid growth of aquaculture there, and it wasn't an outside, you know, foreign aid agency coming in and doing this. It was very much homegrown Vietnam is, is pushing ahead to with with full force to for for scale and efficiency and to become kind of the the international you know source of of catfish um, <clears throat> but in the process they've and, and they're trying actually to give them credit they're really trying to do it in a sustainable way and World Wildlife Fund is very much involved in in that process and working with these big producers at the same time, you know, these small producers um, have been completely um, wiped out of the process because they can't compete with these scaled up versions. Um, and, and with that, you've lost a lot of the opportunity um, for these more integrated on-farm inputs, um, some, of the, some of the even more sustainable practices of aquaculture where you're, where you're integrating your farm waste into the fish feed. It, none of that translates um, when you're selling a you know, when you're selling on the international markets, and this is this is part of the big problem, is um, it all has to be, you know, to the certain international certifi certified standards. And what that is, is you're importing soy from Brazil or wherever to put into this feed so it's consistent and it passes those safety standards to be able to sell it. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I think, I think it's, so often this is a story about trade-offs and, um, and what is the, you know, the system that works going forward, I don't, I don't know. Um, uh, I think a lot of times that you, I, I see it as maybe a dual system where you're not, you know, you're, you're 
focusing on the, the, the big um, global commodities and exports and so on, but not forgetting about you know the people in Umai Umai or the, 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 the kind of benefits that you can gain from these what are essentially incredibly cheap programs um, that have you know such a huge dividend um, in the end. Um, and it, you know, I, as I said, I was the, the PRI's the world is going to be um, is going to be the next. I think sometime in April or May, we're going to air the the next chapter in the series, which is going to look at the future of food. Um, and even if, as I'm planning that, I keep coming back to this experience that I had in Umai Umai, where um, where I think about the question that these people that I profiled in there are struggling with, um, uh, of you know putting food on the table versus, um, versus uh, you know, the short term kind of harming the environment um, to feed your family. Um, and it's a question that um, I guarantee uh, when you think of the next two billion people that are gonna be on the planet are gonna be struggling with as well. I mean, it's, it's the, the poorest and the most climate sensitive <coughs> countries that, that have the highest population growth. Um, and that question being how do you produce more food with less um, in a way that doesn't completely uh, jeopardize the planet and its ecosystems in the process. Um, personally, I, I think that the, um, the, the kind of scattered approach or the single-minded approach to aid and to programs um, to, to address this um, aren't gonna work uh, given the extreme challenges that we're facing on this planet. Um, and that an integrated approach is going to be essential. The question, I think, is just will um, will it translate to government? Will it translate to policymakers, to to the corporations that I think have a lot of power in this as well? Um, will will all of those players get on board in a, in any meaningful way and and also do it fast enough? So <laughs> I think I'll I'll leave it there and um, and uh, we can go to questions or. Thank you, Sam. Those are Thank certainly you. the big challenges. And um, Imelda is going to tell us a little bit about her perspective from the Philippines on some of those challenges and the trends going forward. Hi. Um, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here with you. And thanks to the Wilson Center and Megan, of course, for inviting me over here. Uh, two things I got from uh, this uh, film of Sam is that uh, one is that it's a very good thing that we've, we're getting international attention to this problem. And the second thing is that it's a very, s very sad that we're, we're highlighting population problem in the Philippines. But we have to do something about it. Well, as a journalist, uh, we have been highlighting development, poverty issues, environment issues, of course, climate change and disasters in the Philippines. And the issue of population growth, diminishing food, and the environment are all interconnected. So it's not surprising for me as a reporter uh, anymore for this kind of uh, issues. So that even, uh, that's why even though our reporting, we're trying to, uh, to bring the real upfront situation uh, in uh, fishing communities in, uh, and in other rural areas. So it's a very tough job for, for us uh, to be reporting on these issues, but we have the responsi responsibility to raise awareness and to of, of of this such um, problems in the Philippines, and we have to push for uh, government action, policy action, and and I was just uh, discussing with uh, Sam a while ago that for how many years we've been relying on international donors, you know, international <coughs> aid from U.S. aid, uh, from the foundation, from the United Nations, and with the passage of this uh, RH bill, I think we can do something for ourselves, for our country at this point in time. So um, the film indicates that all is not well with the food supply system in the Philippines. So that's, that's too bad. But the issue of rapid population in this and growth of and uh, dwindling fish stocks on land or farming are fundamental reasons aggravated by uh, inefficient governance and corruption in, in my country. So population growth has long been a stumbling b block for the country 
and in and in the in in, in in its economic potential. So even before the problems in the uh, uh, in this diminish, diminishing food supply hug the headlines, the country's population has long been pointed out as a factor for set, setting back growth. So I certainly agree with the issue that Sam has brought uh, in this documentary, and whom I my story is just one of thousands of villages in the Philippines that's suffering below poverty line. Uh, population as a major factor for food security is highlighted by the fact that Philippines produces uh, more rice than Thailand, and yet, because the latter has le less mouth to feed with 65 million, it can afford to export and is a major rice producer in Asia. So according to, well, according to the uh, census of the National Statistics Office released last year, our population is at 92.3 million, and I guess it's more than that, more than like 100 million, I guess. And in 2015, it is expected to be like 120 million if we don't do anything about it. But uh, so coastal communities, remote mountainous areas, often lack access to and knowledge about basic medical services, including reproductive health, information, not just contraceptives, you know, birth control pills, and on how they manage their families. But thanks to, yes, uh, I've I mentioned the international donors. So getting back to this uh, community, uh, fishing community, I've reported a lot on this uh, and uh, talked to fishermen, live with them for like up to four, four weeks just to get the real story from the women, from the children, and from the fishermen themselves. So uh, one time I went to this fishing village and uh, I saw farmers coming back to their home and mm. they, they were like outside in the open sea for six, eight hours. And then I just saw them that they, they went back with nothing, no fish at all. So I asked them, how come you don't have any single, single uh, fish with you? And they said, I'm not sure. Maybe it's because of uh, the environment. They don't know actually about climate change or the rising sea level or the effects of uh, uh, water desalination or some factors of uh, environmental issues. So with, with that, I think it's, it's a problem of, um, I guess, the, not just the environment, but on policies, of, uh, I mean, not just on the environment, but the policies, the government, you know. And they're really coping with this, uh, struggling with uh, uh, the fish stock. They really want to have this uh, they, would re they really want to uh, produce more to sell to the markets, but they themselves, they don't have any single fish. So that's, that's really a reality. So I think the only solution to this uh, mounting problem is to curb population growth through the avail availability of <coughs> birth control, reproductive health, information, and education. So it's, it's a good thing that um, the, the Republic, Republic Health Bill was just passed last December, and it was signed by the president this January. So it was like two decades of battle from the Congress to the Senate, and it's good that we have this uh, very empowered women at the Senate who really um, defended on this uh, bill. So you may ask what took it so long to become a law? The Catholic Church was a staunch uh, opponent of the bill. They say it will not benefit the poor people, but the giant pharmaceutical companies using uh, this kind of um, birth control cons contraceptives and are perceived as evil, are perceived as evil, and they even threatened uh, pro-RH politicians, including the president, with excommunication. So it was a tough job, really, for us to to, to uh, report on this, and it was also a tough journey for the bill to be passed. So our country, let's face it, it's still struggling to cope with its rapidly growing population, and we are beyond the carrying capacity 
of the country with almost yeah, 100 million population and a very tiny low lying areas so the average actually the average uh, typhoon that passed in our country is like 20 a year so you can just imagine how many disasters how many floodings that we experience and uh, as, as I'm talking right now there are uh, some people suffering on a uh, flooding still so it's it, it's it's a, a tough job for for us to to report on these issues but we have to thank you Imelda thank you. That's, that's very powerful I wanted to ask both of you a question I'll take the prerogative and ask you the first and I wanted to ask what's been the reaction to, to this piece uh, Sam that you showed uh, from not just the public, but also if you uh, had any um, uh, reaction from other reporters um, about uh, moving into an area that, you, as you said, has a lot, faces a lot of challenges from reporting as far as being difficult to report on, but also from um, uh, other uh, groups working in the area or governments <coughs> and just sort of what, what you got. And similarly for you, Imelda, if you comment on, on as you've moved from reporting within the Philippines to reporting on broader global issues, how you've had to adjust and what reactions, that you've, different reactions you've gotten from moving uh, into more international um, sphere of reporting. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, um, I, when these stories came out, they came out on the same day, the, the news hour piece and the marketplace uh, piece both aired. And I was holding my breath and waiting for the, the slew of hate mail to come in. Um, uh, and it didn't happen, really. I, you know, I think that on the news hour side, on the marketplace side, there was actually an interesting conversation. Um, that started in the comment section. It was very much um, an intelligent comment, for the most part. I mean, you always get those, the, the, the comments that you want to just kind of hit delete because it doesn't really add anything to the, to the conversation. But it was, um, I, I feel like, and, and I don't know why that is. Like maybe there's, I, I feel like the conversation may be changing um, instead of just this reaction to, it's population control, we can't talk about that. You know, this, we've talked about this in the 70s and it didn't prove to be true. I think people really see that there is resource scarcity and maybe we've just kind of put it off. We've moved that target back a little bit. And, um, and it's hard to find, well, I don't know if it's hard to find people that aren't willing to see that, but I think that it's harder to deny that we're not entering a, a kind of new phase um, where all of these issues matter in a, in a way um, that they didn't necessarily, or they weren't on our, in our imagination before. Um, I guess that's my thinking on it as far as the reaction. Um, the, this story actually, it also got a lot of, um, a lot of uh, kind of re it, it, it triggered a lot of discussion outside of um, this story uh, with, I think, on your blog, you guys had mentioned it. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, <coughs> forgetting, it, I think it's the Catholic National Reporter did a piece on it, um, which was very much supporting it, um, which I thought was, was, was fascinating. Um, and uh, Joan was, was telling me, she, she, I was um, going back and forth with her as well, and she said that, they, that actually they, received a bunch of donations um, after this piece. And they ended up, um, she said that they, they took the money and they made these, um, these birth control kits uh, that they gave to small convenience shops on island villages. And so they set up these, um, these new, basically, the little, um, the little shops. And those are now self-sustaining. And so that, for me, is such a rare thing that a story actually you know, tra and, and I get almost a little bit uncomfortable with it too, but <laughs> um, it, that something actually happened out of the story. I mean, so much of the time I'm doing these stories and then I, you know, you're moving on to the next thing. And um, uh, so it felt, you know, I, I think that that's a, that's a, that's a kind of a, a rare thing. And, um, and I don't know if it was just, uh, it seemed to break new ground. I mean, I, it seemed to kind of, on a, on a, on a, to a big audience, talk about population, health, and environment. Um, I don't know if it was for the first time, but in a way that resonated with people. And, I, and um, I'm really happy about that. And uh, what else was I going to say? I, I, Joan was saying that, um, that, you know, as far as the issue of scale, 
that uh, since the uh, since the reproductive health bill passed, they're actually um, looking at this program as there are two government agencies: the Responsible Parent. No, wait, no, that's not it. Um, the National Population Commission and the Department of Environment and Natural Resources are are now um, actively advocating the PHE approach to family planning and and are looking at scaling it up in the Philippines. So that's. Um, that's pretty interesting. That, that's great. And it, it's off, so often, even if you do have that input, you don't always hear about it. So it's also nice yes. to, to learn yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah for sure. Imelda? I, I feel that we can just keep this problem among ourselves in the Philippines. It's, it's an issue that's meant to be shared with other Asian countries or even internationally. And uh, this... Uh, we, 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 we wanted to follow up these issues highlighting solutions. That's why it's from local to national. So bringing the local solutions right. into the national and uh, national arena. Right. Yeah. Uh, that is a certainly a, um, something that as a reporter you're well placed <coughs> to, to do that is hard for others to do. So that's and I think so important too when you talk about these issues because often the the you know, the response is just to throw your hands up and be, you know, like, ah, it's just overwhelming. How are we ever going to get out of this? And so to see these places where these things actually work and, um, you know, I've covered climate change a lot and that's, you know, we're talking about <laughs> uh, so often it's talking about how do you move the next technology of green energy out here? We're talking about, you know, technology that's like available and cheap and um, this is, uh, when you look at the problems facing the planet, this is kind of this this no-brainer in a way because we have the, the technology is just so so readily available. It's a fix that that is is um, affordable and um, easy. It's just the so highly politicized that um, that I don't know. You know, there's just so many obstacles in the way because of that. But but you think of I, I think that's what what is the the statistic for the unmet need globally is um, is just so huge and and kind of when you think of the UN population projections of nine billion, um, you know you can you can add a billion and a half on either side of that depending on um, you know whether you get contraception and family planning to those women of the world that aren't getting it right now. Yeah. And one of the impacts that I've thought of is that. Um, writing these kinds of stories and connecting it to climate change or environment is that we had a, de a, s a memorandum with the Philippine government right now on climate change reporting connected with health and population issues, environment. Okay. Okay. On the, um, well, we'll take some questions from the audience. My colleagues will have microphones uh, to hand out. And please remember to state your name and your affiliation. Uh, and uh, I, since uh, Sam mentioned scaling up, I wanted to, um, uh, to put Roger Mark in the spotlight um, right away to talk a little bit about scaling up or, and then uh, see if he had some questions to throw into the mix as well. Thank you very much, Megan, and thank you, Sam and Imeldo. So uh, I, I had a couple of questions. I wasn't going to talk about scaling up immediately, <laughs> but we could talk about that later. Um, so. First, just to say thank you. It's a wonderful job. Um, I'm Roger Mark D'Souza. I work at Population Action International and, in fact, um, work on the integration of population, uh, women's empowerment, and climate change adaptation. And we have been using this film, your film, in a number of other countries like Bangladesh, where we're working to show them what's possible in, in other areas. Um, I was very glad to hear you talk about some of the broader efforts around population, health, and environment in the Philippines. The Philippines legislators Committee on Population and Development, who's one of the major advocates of the, of the RH bill, has just released a film called Nexus. It's a half an hour film that's looking at these connections. The state of the Philippine report, 
which is called Seeking a Healthy Balance, focuses on population, health, and environment, was just released and is in the process of, of being um, shared throughout the country. Um, and Joanne Castro is, in fact, very involved in getting the message out on, on this. Uh, a few years ago, um, when I worked at Population Reference Bureau, we were doing training of Filipino journalists in the Philippines. And we had a very interesting discussion with the journalists. And they explained to me, we were training them in techniques for investigative journalism. And they said to me, you know, Roger Mark, the way that you Americans talk about journalism is very different from how we Pinos talk about it. Um, and they said, our reporting is what we call developmental journalism. And they say it means that we are very engaged, we're directly involved, we have a responsibility, and we have a responsibility to point to solutions and to act. Um, and in talking with our US media counterparts around this, there were lots of questions around, well, impartiality, how are you presenting a balanced story? What does that mean? So with that framing, I have a, a question for each of you. Um, Sam, I wondered whether you could talk a little bit about, in reporting this kind of story, what do you hope to accomplish as a journalist? And, and Imelda, I was intrigued in, in talking with the Filipino journalists to hear them say, you know, when we cover these issues, there is a real threat to me as an individual. I get calls at my home threatening my family. Why are you covering this? Why are you bringing in population? Why are you exposing corruption? Um, so that there are some real threats as an environmental journalist to try and make these links that we sitting here in Washington may not necessarily think about. And I, whether you, I, whether, I wondered whether you could talk a little bit about how difficult it is as an environmental journalist to make these connections, um, putting aside the Catholic Church, which we recognize is, is difficult in this context, there are another set of threats that we may not necessarily think of. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start. Um, what I hope to accomplish um, when I when I set out to do a story like this, um, I think what I really want to do is is um, you, you know these concepts. So we, we talk in in news a lot about stories that are finding stories that are verbs, not nouns. And a lot of times with these stories, they're about nouns. It's like you are going after something like population. You know, how do you make that? resonate with an audience? How do, you, how do you tell a story about that that, well, people will remember? And I think a lot of times you don't. You just talk about it, and it's, it's an interesting piece that, um, you know, is informative, and, and um, you know, you move on afterwards, um, hopefully a little bit more knowledgeable. I think what I really wanted to do with this piece was find people, you know, this was a, a village where people were doing something where um, all of these issues were playing out in their daily choices and of, of their lives. Um, and I think that's where you get, you know, the power of a story that, that people will see and people who have, who are from completely different circumstances, you know, here in the United States where it's hard to kind of you know, remember or understand um, that uh, situation and the the challenge of of really you know facing those those kinds of um, those kinds of daily choices. So that kind of fell in my lap, which is wonderful. Um, in that sense, um, it was a, as I said, it was a ready-made story from that perspective. What I also want to do, though, is is not just go in and say, "Here's this story," and then end. You know, I want to. Uh, um, I've, I've, as I said, I've covered climate change and and uh, global sustainability issues long enough that I can recognize some of the I can recognize a lot of or maybe too many of the interleaking um, patterns between all of these issues. And you know, there's there's only so much you can do in a in a 10 minute piece, which is kind of you know amazing to have 10 minutes these days on TV to produce something. Um, but um, that's, I think, the, the other main thing I want to accomplish is, is go from this, you know, very human story to um, how does this, what does this mean in the context of the rest of the world? The, the challenge of population growth, um, 
and and kind of put that in in context um hopefully in a meaningful way i mean i, I think that's what i that's what i strive to do and that's what we're looking you know as i'm 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 buried in this right now trying to um to find the stories for the next or develop the stories for the next part of the series and um faced with many of these these same challenges so you know the philippines is the f we have the freest media in southeast asia but we have a price tag to it yeah that's true um journalists reporting on a controversial issues such as on environment lagging and corruption they are being threatened by government officials connected connected into that controversial issues or big uh companies that issues so it's it's really 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 hard for us to report on these issues and sometimes some some reporters uh, are into self censorship so that they can just save their, their, their themselves you know and regarding the, uh, the reporting on the Catholic Church side, side, most of the journalists in the Philippines are still very uh, conservative, and they don't want to hurt the, the opinion of the church. But just yesterday, there is one um, pro-RH, you know, um, journalists are activists, who was put into jail because of saying something against church on this reproductive health. So that kind of issue, it's really, we're still struggling on reporting those issues. Uh, Lisa? Thanks. Um, Lisa Friedman, I write for Climate Wire. We're an energy policy magazine here. and. Um, I guess both of my questions kind of bounce off of, of Ray's. Um, Imelda, you know, other than the issue of being threatened, can you talk a little bit about how interested editors are generally in environmental news outside maybe of extreme weather events like the typhoon, um, you know, recently? Um, you know, obviously some of the politicians in, in the Philippines are like rock stars at the UN climate events, but on a day-to-day -day basis, is this, um, you know, is this a topic that that editors are interested in? That it's a, is it a hard sell? What are what are some of the challenges? And I guess Sam, I don't know if there's anything to, to add because you you were what my question was going to be, and maybe you've already answered it. Was you know, kind of how do you take uh, these big ideas, right, population and health and environment, and make it you know, into the, the kind of specific and tangible and human piece that you did and a little bit about your process and kind of how that works when you're dealing with something now like you're about to with, with food. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about how you break that down in, into the process. Thanks. So right now, more and more journalists are <laughs> reporting on uh, climate change issues. Yeah, maybe it's because of the extreme weather events also, and the disasters that's happening in the Philippines. And just imagine 20 typhoons a year. So it's still connected to, to climate change issues. And uh, we have, for this year, we have, uh, the government is prioritizing climate change issues. And we have this uh, clim uh, um, national elections, and most of the uh, politicians are using climate change for them to win. Yeah, it's it's a hot issue. That's that's one reason why I <coughs> organized this uh, Philippine network of environmental journalists. It's because we have really have to intensify our reporting in in, in my country. And Sam, a little bit about finding yeah, the just a little bit about the finding the human stories. Um, it's hard. Uh, <laughs> it's. Thank you. They, the, I feel like the piece that um, aired on Marketplace in, in conjunction with this was even more challenging because it didn't have that one place. And so what I tried to do with that one was um, profile this woman I had met in the slum um, called Vitas in, in uh, Manila, where they live off of the garbage, essentially. Um, it's a garbage dump slum. Um, and use kind of bring her story to life a little bit. She had 11 children. I think she had um, 14, but three right, uh, had died from, you know, uh, what was it? Um, 
I'm trying to remember. It was diseases that, you know, you, 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 I mean, it's just, it was such a toxic place. Um, and she had, she had actually had an IUD, but she had it removed because she thought it was giving her asthma um, in a garbage dump where they're burning plastic and, um, you know, cracking open the, the, um, the compact fluorescent bulbs right into the ground. I mean, it was, the, the ground was essentially garbage. And so it was this spongy kind of, um, uh, ground and just being exposed to so many different things. Um, so I think I mean, with that one, I tried to, to kind of frame the piece around her and then go into the big ideas because that one was very much a noun story in, in many ways. Um, and as I'm going forward, um, these, it doesn't always work out. I mean, you, you really have to find um, the characters that are passionate about something. I mean, that really translates well. Um, so I'm, um, I'm looking in India, um, where these farmers are, are, um, in Northern, Northern India and Bihar are, are, are incredibly passionate about, um, breaking the world records for system of rice intensification and all of the other intensive agricultural methods. Um, and the town is kind of, you know, creating this as their identity and they're competitive for the rest of India and the rest of the world. And so that, you know, to me speaks of a nice story um, and, and a jumping off point to talk about um, global agriculture and, um, uh, you know, the challenges it faces. Um, one, in, one example. Um, I'm always looking for the human element. I mean, that just, it really... Uh, these, whether it's climate, um, which you're, re you're reporting a lot on, that's the toughest one to do because it's just so kind of, I, I think so much of it just becomes over, I, you know, I talk to a lot of people about outside of my reporting about this and try to get a sense of what their response is. And a lot of times it's just overwhelming and ah, we can't do anything. And so it's, it's, it's almost like they just write it off and don't want to think about it. But I find that, you know, if we can boil it down to, Either a solution, as you're talking, as you know, is 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 you were saying is so so powerful, or just people that are that are struggling with this and their daily decisions. It it um, makes more sense, I guess, to us. Is there one in the oh, uh, Linda over here? I don't know if we can get it over there and then press it. Hi. Yeah, we saw each other in uh, yeah. in uh, Umai Umai. In the Philippines, <laughs> when you were uh, actually filming, reporting. doing yeah. interviewing. A uh, nice piece again. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You. Now I just want to give you a quick update about the mm. Philippines. You know, I'm I'm Linda Bruce with the University of Rhode Island and uh, project director for the Balance Project, and USAID has given us field support funds and over 1.5 million dollars, 1.6 to be precise, to actually scale up this PHE approach mm. in uh, quite a few sites in in Batangas and Bohol, and it, it's interesting what's emerging. Because, as you know, PFPI has worked on this integrated approach for many, many years and done different models. Um, what's emerging is that in Bohol, where they have done a lot of work before, the governments are used to them, they're used to the approach. It's, it's much easier to get buy-in. They have switched from working only with these sorry, sorry stores where they give out the pills or sell the pills to incorporating it more into the uh, Ministry of Health, the rural health units. And so in Behold, it's actually easier because people have known about PHE for a long time. It's a little bit further away from Manila. And the system seems to be working because in order to really make it sustainable is to get it into the Ministry of Health system, which is what USAID really would like to see happen. But we're observing in Batangas, which is much closer to Manila, <coughs> maybe an hour and a half, two hour drive, is that they're still extremely conservative. And the government won't blink without really watching what effect the blink will have on, on the church. And so we're finding that they're not, even the, the local governments are not giving family planning supplies to the rural health units. And so it's more difficult to do the PHE project through the rural health units in Batangas. So we find that two models are actually emerging. One in Batangas, we're going back more to the private sector and these sorry, sorry stores. And then in Bohol and Leyte and some other places where the governments are much more open is to actually trying to incorporate this. So the, at the end of the project, USAID is asking to have a description of two models 
because they, I think, I get the sense that they would also like to continue investments. The other thing is really interesting. I think this is, the f I think, now I, I may be misquoting, this is the first time where two different offices in with USAID have funded a PhD project. One of them is the Office of Environment. They have put in $800,000. $800, and then the Office of Health put in $800,000 for population, for family planning activities. So we're working very closely with CI, Conservation International as well. So it truly is a, a real PhD project. But every island and site has different characteristics. And I think that's another really important lesson learned in these integrated approaches, is you sort of have to go in the path of least resistance and incorporate where you can. The other issue is getting these supplies to these very remote island sites that PSI, DKT, and those private sector suppliers. It's not a win for them to deliver a, a box of 100 condoms or pills, you know. I mean, they're, they're into the big cities and the big deliveries. And also, it's very difficult to get to these sites, which is why they've had to revert to some of these CBD kits and work with the local pharmacies. So, But they're working out the, the glitches, but these are all very important lessons learned. But I wanted to mention that USAID has invested quite a bit of money through two bureaus to try to scale this approach up. Thanks, Linda. It's important to note the challenges to scaling up that you did, such as the, the remoteness and the variability, and yeah. I think that's an important highlight. Um, let's see, uh, over here. Uh, I'm Helen Raffel with Resources for the Future. I wonder if you know of any ongoing commercial development of marine plants. After all, the only source of food from the sea is not the fish. The fish themselves eat plants that are marine plants. And with our melting of the glaciers that feed our major freshwater rivers and the rising of the sea level, it seems to me there's a commercial opportunity there for large scale development, not only of seaweed, but potential other plants that can survive on salt water. Uh, we may absolutely need that in the future. Have you heard of any such developments? Well, I know that the, the seaweed production in the Philippines is huge, and there, there actually have been projects um, that um, I, I don't, I'm not going to be very specific because I remember when I was researching this story, I was lo actually looking into that as well, um, that they are, there have been investments in, in kind of retraining farmers, I mean, retraining some of these fishermen to, to be seaweed farmers to ease the pressure on the reefs, um, uh, and I'm not sure how you know, successful they've been, um, but it is a huge, um, a huge, huge undertaking. And when I was in uh, reporting in Japan, that's you know, it's it's very much um, a part of their aquaculture. There is seaweed raising seaweed, um, so a huge. Um, I, I think a lot of potential there for uh, a source of food from the sea that's a little bit more takes less, you know, inputs um, and such. <laughs> I know when I was lucky enough to go to the Philippines, I saw some of the seaweed farming there. And uh, I think my colleague, uh, uh, Sean, who stepped out, was also saw some of that in, in Tanzania as well. So it's a, it's a good thing. There was a problem. I, I, I remember the fishermen kind of griping about it, though, because there were some problems with some of the gear from the seaweed farms washing over the reefs. Or so I, I, and I'm, I'm not going to be specific on that either, but, um, you know, it's all... It's how it's how the stuff is managed. Um, is sure, yeah. Over here, in Nika. Hi, um, Adam Jalab. I'm from American University. I'm curious to hear more about the fishermen themselves. Um, we see all over the world, right, that there's a whole bunch of other pressures that that cause fishermen, large and small, to take from the sea. And I'm wondering, in the case of the Philippines, if um, on the one hand, Sam, your, uh, the mother from your story says, well, I don't want my children to be fishermen. Um, on the other hand, you show us the markets. We've seen in many other countries that the minute fishermen have a little bit of capital, they reinvest, they scale up, they can um, sell fish oil so that that fish oil can be sold back to either feed other fish or feed chickens. It, I'm wondering, the fishermen themselves, do they actually want to fish less or do they just want to capture more profit from the fishermen? And Imelda, you've said you've spent 
quite a bit of time with them, so I'd be curious to hear your viewpoint as well. It's, it's, it's still a problem in the Philippines. It's still the dwindling fish stocks. So sometimes uh, the fishermen, they don't want to sell the small amount that they have to the market anymore. So it, it's really a challenging, challenging for these farmers to produce more, to get, to catch more fish. Yeah, I think um, with the fishermen that I was speaking with, I mean, they have, you saw their, their boats, they're, you know, you can barely fit three people in them. There wasn't really, uh, I, I think, um, you know, they, they got that they wanted their kids not to be fishermen, but also to, you know, out of um, interest uh, for the reef as well, because they know that if every kid becomes a fisherman, you know, they've seen that, that, that growth. And I, I'm, I'm trying to remember the statistic, but it was um, just the amount of fishermen in the Philippines now is, um, I can't remember how many times greater than it was even 20 years ago. I mean, there's just been such a, a huge growth in fishermen taxing the reef systems there. Um, so there wasn't that ambition. Um, that said, the people that were, uh, the boats that they were confiscating, um, oftentimes the, the people on the boats weren't the owners of the boats. And so it was, it was somebody who owned some boats and he'd send out these poor guys that, you know, to use dynamite or cyanide or these illegal nets. Um, and um, they kind of, you know, beach the boats and run as soon as they see the patrols. Um, so I think those guys are, there's a little bit more of that um, scaling up and trying to catch these illegal fish that then will, you know, sometimes end up in the markets. But you can, you can tell, you know, the, the eyes, um, by, they check the fish at the markets for dynamite um, fishing because you can, you can actually see, I think, in their eyes or something, you know, the, the shock of the, yeah, exactly. Um, but it's a, it's a big issue. I mean, you know, then there's the difference between these small, little villages and the, the bigger fleets that are, you know, where the... Moving it from mouths to feed to markets to feed. Yeah. 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 Down here. If I, yes, uh, wait for the microphone, please. Thank you very much. Very interesting video. Thank you. Uh, my name is Heather Jeffen. I'm freelance consultant for development in general, including population, sustainable agriculture. There is one part of your production video that keep raising this priest said, why we don't produce more food, you know? And that was left an answer. For God's sake, we've been trying to produce f f more food, but there is a limit. The land is already used, uh, the yield is maximized, and there is no more opportunity plus the environmental and climate changes prevent. But nobody answered him. You know, this question stayed like he's so smart. Why don't we produce more food? We try. We've been trying forever. In fact, there is a lot of question. Now there is one billion people are hungry. And we are not able to feed them. With all the effort, USAID, the World Bank, United Nations. We are not. We're trying our best. We're using the most advanced technology, genetically modified organism to produce better product, etc., better yield, resistant disease, and we're still unable to feed one billion people in the world population. And he's sitting there and saying and left an answer. But I also loved you raised a lot of questions all all very valuable. We've been trying to find an answer to all this question over and over again. And I hope by you raising those questions, you help us to go to grassroots and find some answer. And what also find interesting in your presentation, this lady, she said, I don't want my family to be just like where I was growing up, one of eight or nine, and how many people like her? I mean, I think it has to start from the local people. They have to realize we have to have population. You know, we, we don't want our children to starve. We don't want them to do these things. What do you think, how many people are going to be like her? I mean, she may be one in million or one in 
100,000, I don't know, but if this is how it is going to start, I think they, there is a change that's going to happen. It might not be as fast as we wanted, but that's great steps. How can we move it or give it energy to keep Make it yeah, I mean, I think part of the tragedy was every woman I talked to, um, and this is especially in the slums of Manila, um, I asked them, I asked everyone, like, how many children would you have wanted to have? And nobody said more than three. Yeah, so it's Not one of them, yeah. But, um, you know, circumstances got the better of them and, and access to, I, I, you know, the mayor of, the, of Manila at one point was, um, <coughs> had banned contraception in Manila and was, was holding award ceremonies for the families that had the most children. I mean, it was, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, so, so it's, yeah. And, and so many of these women that I was talking to in the slums had, you know, there was a clinic um, right called Likon right outside of the slum that was, was doing incredible work. Um, but, um, you know, they hadn't been there for very long. And, you know, when it's, when it's just, uh, you know, when when <laughs> when the poor are only getting family planning because of NGOs, I mean, and the funding has been so kind of sporadic for that that it's um, you know it's a tough road. And so you know, these women still have 11 kids even though they wanted two or three. Thank you. We have a uh, Roger. Mar oh wait, let's get one more new one here. Yes, uh, Gamirika, can you sorry wave the microphone? Thank you. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I'm Ethan Goffman from uh, Sustainability, Science, Practice, and Policy. Um, I guess I have two questions. Um, first is, I believe you gave the statistic by 2080, the population would be up to 200 million. Um, yeah, now I think is, is Walden Bellow said that. What? I, uh, that was in the video are you talking about? Yeah, in the yeah, video. But I think Walden Bellow said that in his. Okay, because I'm wondering with the new law, I'm wondering how much that's going to bend the curve, um, how much other factors such as, you know, local initiatives or they, I guess educating women as always. So kind of what combination and how much that's likely to bend the curve. Um, and I guess we want to do it like in a human rights way, but China did a, a much more coercive method. So can, <laughs> I mean, I if you can speculate about comparing the two methods and realistically I you know can you be sensitive to human rights and not go the Chinese route <laughs> do you want to start with her? okay um it, you did you say you wanted to start yeah. okay uh the um the question as to whether that is going to change uh the curb of 20 by 2080 200 million I mean, it's 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 never you know 100 percent precise on these projections but um the answer i think is not much um you, you know it's there's uh the concept of population momentum which i i expo i toyed with putting in the piece, but then it just, it was how many concepts can you throw into these, these things. Um, but there's, um, there's such a young, you know, there's such a, a, a bubble of young people in the Philippines that are going to reach reproductive age that even if they're having two children, you're still going to have um, a pretty great population growth there. Um, Walden Bello was, um, you know, he, he was frank with me. He said, you know, to really tackle this, we needed to tackle it you know, 30, 40 years ago when they first started, or, or when Thailand did, um, I think back in the 60s. Um, the Philippines actually in the 60s was one of the most progressive on this issue, and then they, they retreated from it really quickly. Um, so it gives you a sense of, you know, the, 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 where the Philippines could have been right now versus where it is um, with these issues. Um, but as as Bello pointed out to me, you know, better late than never. I mean, you have to start somewhere. And um, the more, you know, the longer you wait, the worse the outcome is going to be for the future and as far as feeding um, the people of the Philippines. Um, so uh, and the second part of your question, I'm trying to remember, was um, Ethan. Um, um, China and their coercion. Oh, China, yeah. I think one child policy, that sort. I think that that's not necessary. I mean, I think that you give women these choices and they'll take them, and it's not, there's no coercion that's needed here. I mean, it's just a matter of access, and it's a matter of education. Um, 
you know, the more education women have, the more they're willing to make these choices. Um, you know, a lot of times when in extreme poverty, it's the men that um, are are very um, in control of this. I mean, a lot of the women at the clinic at the slum in Manila were there secretly. They'd tell their husbands they're going for a walk and go get their shot. And um, <laughs> and um, they'd had very they'd had a lot of um, instances where the men find out and um, and beat up the wives or actually try to pull out the IUD. You know, things like that. I mean, it's it's really um, an issue. So. Um, the more women, I think, have education and are empowered in this process, the more, uh, you know, the coercion doesn't really need to happen. It's not population control. It's just about giving access. Yeah. I, I cannot speculate much on the statistics. We are still in the C on the result of, we're still in the implementation stage of this uh, RH bill, and it's being contested at the Supreme Court and we, we, we don't really know what the outcome of this uh, law yet. Do you have, a, is there any timeline that you think that, it, or could it drag on for? No idea. No, no, no idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, up front here, Anika, if you could. Um, good afternoon. Thank you. This has been very informative. Um, my name is Margaret Walsh. I'm in the Climate Change Office at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And I'm curious how um, important do you see climate change issues um, related to some of the obviously very pressing concerns um, influencing food security in the Philippines right now? And how do you see that manifesting? You alluded to some issues related to production, but um, I mean, you know, trade, um, water, issues, that, that sort of thing as well. I'm curious. Thank you. Yeah. Climate change issues. Yeah, as I've mentioned, you know, with the, with the disasters in the Philippines, you know, we are really focusing on uh, prioritizing climate change mitigation adaptation measures at the local level. You know, and uh, in terms of food security, you know, how can a poor country produce more food vis-a-vis -vis with this uh, corruption? And we don't have really a food uh, security system in the Philippines. So that's really a big question. Sam, in your future food pieces, are you looking at climate change? Very much. Yeah, I mean, climate change in this next um, series, in this next um, piece, uh, series of stories that's going to air on the world, climate is is one of the through lines for every story that we're going to do. Um, and uh, what do I say? Tune in. And <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, I mean, we're still kind of finalizing the story. It's still, you know, in the development phase. Um, so we're trying to trying to develop these stories. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's such a. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to say something, you know, that's useful for you. I mean, what what kind of um, examples would you be are you interested in hearing about? Thanks. Um, I, I guess I'm just curious about experience to date and where you see the pressures coming in the future. And there are all kinds of issues of scale, so I'm curious, mm -hmm. sort of at the national scale, um, trade, of course, becomes a huge issue. Not necessarily, I mean, domestic pr production matters, but then also trade, food aid becomes an issue, food, and then food sovereignty issues play into it. And I'm just curious how yeah. that looks in the Philippines. You know, it's 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 interesting because it's like the Philippines is um, is a pretty, you know, the average farm is really small. And, the, and that's a uh, through line, I think, for a lot of the developing world and, and um, poorer countries. Um, and so it's always like when you, when you throw that template on, I mean, when you throw that onto the, the national kind of food system where it's commodities that are traded, um, scale becomes very important. And I think that we put so much focus on how do you scale up these farmers? Um, but what's, you know, I guess what I am, undecided about is 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 scaling up the solution here um, you have more people um, scaling up means fewer farmers where are those farmers going to go they're going to go into Manila uh, live in these slums and try to get jobs uh, you know 
putting together clothes or, or electronics? Um, you know, what is the what is the system that that what are the, what are kind of the the effects of, of that? Um, especially, I mean, I think of India. This is a prime example where it's the, such a smallholder system. You know, what is the what is the um, the future there, and how do you invest maybe in these smaller farmers through to incorporate more sustainable practices? Um, I don't know. There's just so many. You know, I mean, it, as I look at climate change, as you lay climate change over these agricultural issues, it's just there's no one solution. I mean, there's this is you know you can't rule out GMOs. I mean, I don't. I haven't seen any evidence that GMOs are are going to bring much um, to the table. But um, you know, I'm not going to rule it out. Um, but also, I think that. You know, sure, sure. I mean, it's it's bringing as much as you can to the to the table and doing it in ways. I mean, it, this is the thing: is as um, it's you know every it, it's going to become more and more the case where every situation is different. And how do you create a resilience on a local level? And and you know, steamrolling over that in you know with this idea of scale um, becomes, I think, you 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 adopt a system that's less and less resilient to these changes. Um, I think that's a good lead-in coming back to, oh, no, Roger, <laughs> he doesn't want to talk about it. <laughs> no, I, I, I was just, I'm sorry. I was just going to make the point which, which builds on the questions that you were asking about China and, 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 and the policy. Um, you know, there's some polling that has been done among environmentalists to determine their receptivity to messages around these issues and the framing of stories around these issues. And, and, and that polling has demonstrated that many environmentalists are not receptive to the population numbers story, but they are very receptive to the woman's empowerment story. And, and you said that, and I, it was a little bit curious for me because I've also heard this in the Philippines. We've talked to Roman Catholic leaders and we say, let's put aside religion. Let's talk about poverty alleviation, improving well-being, or um, livelihood opportunities. And they said, yeah. That's what we want too. It's the same thing. Let's put the population numbers question aside. So I, I wonder, as you framed your story, your story was a population's numbers story to a certain degree. Um, did you think about, well, you know, I could frame this story differently. I could make it about women's empowerment as a first level framing, and the second level framing is population. But to me, you went the opposite direction. I wonder what, we talked a little bit about your process of how you think about framing that story. Did you think about that a little bit? Did, it, did that come up? Yeah, sure. I mean, I wanted to, I think that I didn't want to, you know, I mean, it all comes down to semantics, right? It's like, how do you, how do you frame your, your, uh, your, your fight or, or whatever you're, you're trying to, to get to. But I, you know, as a, as a journalist, I wanted to start with the population issue. I wanted to take, we wanted to take that on, um, head on and through this reporting and not, you know, call it a women's empowerment issue. That's part of it. Um, but we were really trying to show that this is a big issue facing humanity. Um, you know, the UN population projections are this number. How do you feed this many people? Um, you know, here's here's you know here's what this challenge looks like on the ground. Um, but that said, you know, I, I, I interviewed when I was interviewing the woman who's um, at Lee Khan, um, who's uh, runs these clinics around Manila. Um, and does in incredible work um, with the poor and bringing, bringing reproductive health and, um, and uh, counseling and contraception to the poor women. Um, she wouldn't go there. You know, she was very much like, we talk about it in terms of women's empowerment and, and all of that. And so she had definitely um, was uncomfortable with, you know, talking about the population numbers or about the environmental side of it. Um, and that said, I think, I think that I understand the environmental movement's reluctance to do this as well because they've been burned in the past and they don't want to be associated with, like, let's protect all of this environment from all of the bad people that are going to come in and chew it up. And so, um, you know, I understand the, the kind of tricky dance that environmentalists have to play when they're, when they're talking about population issues. Well, 
already. Well, the way I do my stories that I put the human face first, yeah. then the problem and the solution at the end. I think it's more powerful doing it that way. Well, uh, Melda has to catch a plane, uh, which hopefully will be on time, even given the weather. So I want everyone to join me in please thanking our panelists for a really great set of presentations today. And thank you all very much for coming out. And the webcast will be available on wilsoncenter.org uh, later this week.